Um, so when we focus on what people are actually doing, it leads to goals. Another thing we talked about in terms of behavior, conversation start. You know, what the focus on what people do. Um, so it's like, oh, you know, when I'm out having a cigarette um, and I see somebody, it leads me to, you know, maybe have a conversation with them. Um, not necessarily are we going to tackle feelings of, you know, inadequacy of being alone or some like, you know, really um, psychoanalytic view of the situation. We're going to focus on what she does. Any questions on that? That's an important concept when you're new to the field, really trying to um, focus on the actions of people and not kind of person you think they are. So, since the behavior is driving, the clinician would suggest, like, all right, since you do this when you're driving, let's try something else, like listening to music instead of smoking or driving. Well, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't even make the suggestion. But they would, they would first might say, they might first might make the connection. Be like, so I'm noticing this pattern that you said you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned that you're stressed. You mentioned stress in general is, is something that um, a relief of stress is you mentioned driving. Um, so what we would then do is say something like, is there something that you can do other than so? You know, we wouldn't actually go so far as to say, you should do this instead. Well, you know what? Listening to music would be a much better thing. So I'm saying, you look at me and you're like, it ain't the same damn thing. <laughs> right? No, um, that. Right. So, you, but yeah, you, you, the, the clinician is going to raise it and be like, I'm noticing this. What do you think of that? You know, this association between behavior and substance. Get your opinion. Most likely, like, yeah, that, that's either, yeah, I'm aware of that, or wow, that's actually pretty cool. I didn't notice that. And then we're going to try and give you an alternative. And it's not going to tell you what the alternative is. We're going to try and help you figure out the best alternative. Okay. Any other questions on that? Okay, now we got to be constructive in our planning. We're developing new strategies rather than trying to eliminate bad behavior. So let's get back to smoking in the car, right? Uh, it's like you're not just going to tell them, you know, just don't smoke in the car. It shouldn't be that hard. Um, Rather, let's work on something new we can do in the car. And that hopefully will become the workplace. Um, this is done through skill teaching. And skill teaching is a big part of what we do in psych rehab. Um, this probably is more of a focus in the, the mental health sector than a lot of the focus in, or as much of the focus in substance abuse, but a lot of it is in substance abuse too. You know, how to say no. This is skill, you know, um, being able to um, avoid persons, places, and things, people, places, and things. So it's common, so the people said, right? But, um, easier said than done. You have to teach people strategies, or you have to help them develop new ones rather than just say, don't do that. Um, you can't extinguish a negative behavior unless you help them develop a good alternative. Getting back to smoking the car. It's not enough just like, oh, you anymore. let's work on something else you can do. So it might be like, have you considered music? Music doesn't do Okay. Have you, what about chewing gum? Is it something? So then I, now I really want to explore the behavior. Like, what is it about smoking? Is it having something to do with it? It's, is it, you know, the fact that it makes the time go past, go fly by in the car, you know? Um, so I would want to learn a little bit more about it. You know, what does it do for you? To find the best alternative, it helps suggest a better alternative. The more you know about what the person is getting out of it, the better suggestion or the better you're going to help her figure out something different. That's an important thing too. 
it's not enough to just say, you know, identify the behaviors, like, that's bad, we need to work for that. Um, it's, you have to help them develop, like, okay, what's something else we can do? You might be like, well, I have been thinking about this, like, ah, oh, now he knows the person, you've heard them talking about some other interest in their life. Now we can start making the connections. Or, She's in an, uh, another group, and the clinician told me, you know, oh, I was in a group with Megan, and she mentioned this thing, she's interested in trying this new hobby or something. Like, oh, the IDDT clinician might be able to make you some better. Um, so this is when we talked about people, places, and things, and people that are just starting out in recovery, brand new, this is one of the first really big battles people have to deal with. It's like, you know, these are my friends. I can't just drop my friends. Yeah, they use all the time. Yeah, they're probably going to pressure me if I show up and say I'm not going to use this time. Um, but you know, they're my homies. I can't let you know. Can't just drop them. And I would, you know, I would probably validate that feeling if I was the clinician. Like, you know what? That sounds like you're a really good friend. You know, I, I if I was your friend, I, would, I wouldn't want you to just drop me. Um, so that might involve teaching them a different skill and what kind of skill might we teach that person if they feel that way. Hey Derek, I have a question. Other social skills. What was that? I have a question, Derek. Yes, Sean. <laughs> I'm wondering if you could also use uh, like role playing and modeling to, uh, to teach these new skills. Excellent question, God. <laughs> um, he said, so the question from the back of the room was, can't you also do, like, uh, can a portion of skill teaching be like role modeling and role playing? To say, okay, you know, that I could see that being really hard. Why don't I pretend to be your friend and you tell me that you don't want to use it? And it's a very safe way. It's like, you know, you can practice, you can be like, oh, that didn't go well. It's like, okay, well, what didn't go well about that? Let's do it again, or let's get this person to do it now, and try and say this instead, okay? So, you're gonna say something. No, it was, um, I think we did that in one of our uh, classes. I bet you did, and it won't be the last time. Yeah. We do lots of role plays here, and by the end of your, you hopefully come um, It is something awkward to do in the beginning um, to kind of jump into this. Oh, let's role play, but stay in the field long enough. It's just a second nature. Um, so it's hard to stop using around your friends that you're used to using around. It's often easier just to find new friends. So <laughs> this is the replacement. It's like, okay, so you know what? I get it. you're a good friend. You might not want to say, I'm never going to see these people again, but. Do you think that it might be a good idea to have some alternatives? You'd be like, you know what, maybe if I don't feel like seeing that person, I'm really not in the mood to use, but I don't want to spend time alone and just feel sorry for myself. This is where we start to work on developing new strategy. Okay, well, what can we do? You know, oh, I heard, you know, this other clinician in my group is telling me you're interested in this new hobby. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Oh, I know this other person in the program is interested in that too. And maybe the clinician helps them make a connection with somebody that's also in the program. And now we start the, the process of skill building. Yes? I'm thinking this friend one. I mean, this is probably one of the strengths of the 12 step program. Yep. And that is a lot of times more so than the education that comes with learning about STEM. That camaraderie. For people that are new to sobriety, to say, "All right, I don't want to weave all this BS, but at least I have a bunch of people around me that care about me," and that might be the big thing that gets them into A and keeps them there until they start to learn about what the steps are and kind of finds the right person to guide them. So yeah, it is true. Um, that's a big draw and that's a big positive for the culture. Okay, contextual facts. So, just because people use substances in context, like, oh, I'm doing it to feel good or believe more, uh, doesn't necessarily eliminate the possibility that the substance abuse has a biological component. 
So we're not going to just explain away the addiction because of the content. Oh, it's all because of the trauma they experience. Um, there could be a big biological component, as it is in my um, So uh, just because we're looking at contextual factors doesn't necessarily mean we're ignoring the fact that a lot of these uh, illnesses do are rooted in genetics and have some kind of in um, you really, when you're trying to understand context, you're looking to understand the situation. What exactly is going on here? That's what we use the situation of the car to be driving. What is it about the car? What is it about driving? What is it about walking into a bar and feeling uh, antisocial or uh, nervous about interacting with What is it? And really getting to know the person when the behavior occurs, when does it not occur? It's like if I learned, you know, was in counseling with Megan and I got to find out, it's like, oh, this anxiety only really happens on a certain road, kinds of roads, or at a certain day, I mean, a certain, like going to a certain place. You know, you can start to really understand the situation. Oh, the behavior occurs there, but not there. That's interesting. That might help us better inform our strategy for overcoming or replacing it with something else. So when does it occur and when does it not occur? So here's an example of contextual factors. You know, I think we were talking about it, so why do people use alcohol? And it's like, oh, well, everybody uses it for this. And it's like, well, they might use it to improve their sociability. They might just want to feel good. They might feel bored and want to not feel bored. They might want to numb the depression or relieve anxiety or, you know, any number of reasons. So, just because I have two people with an alcohol issue on my caseload, and I know that Faye uses it because of some traumatic issue, I, I can't just be like, well, it must be the same reason. Um, don't assume you know the reason. Okay, so I'm gonna fly through the rest of this one because I want to give equal due to persuasion. Oops. So maintaining behavior. What are the factors that currently maintain behavior? Why is this continuing? Don't, doesn't focus on the factors that are etiologically responsible. All right, so that's a big word. Can anyone decipher what that means for me? We're trying to figure out the factors that currently maintain the behavior. We're not focusing on the factors that are etiologically responsible. Right. So I don't care about why what. And then why you lose it? No. Right. So I don't care about why you started. Ideological means the origin. I don't care about why it started. I care about what is currently going on now that is making you keep doing this. Because a lot of times it changes, right? It starts out, if I go back to the previous slide, I'm using alcohol just to uh, feel a little more social, and it turns into I'm currently because if I stop using it, I'm going to have seizures. Hmm. That's the important thing to know right now, not to know why you started using alcohol 20 years ago. It might be important, but it's not as important as what's going on right now. The direct implications for treatment lead to a focus on modifying these factors. Okay, so if you stop using alcohol, you are going to have a seizure. That is going to be a direct implication for treatment, right? I'm not going to say, oh, why don't you just stop? You know, it's like, okay, we have a serious situation. Now. It's going to guide the strategies that we use and interventions that we suggest. Um, so we're looking at the current factors that maintain the substance. Why is it happening? Why is it continuing to happen? Not why did it start happening? And then politically, uh, validity. So we never know for sure what's going on. We should always treat things as hypothesis, this is what we think is going on. Uh, it all comes down to the success and failure of intervention. So, okay, we did all this functional analysis, we came up with, Megan is gonna do this, 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 to stop smoking, and if the and intervention one succeeds, great, we're gonna continue to do it, and intervention two didn't succeed, and I'm gonna explore with her, hey, what happened? What, what didn't work there? Oh, okay, now we're going to modify that. We'll try it again. 
failure equals modification. Didn't work, let's try something else. Let's try and do it in a different way, or let's try and up the dosage or intensity of reach, or work with a different counselor. There's a million different ways to modify <laughs> some kind of intervention. Like we're gonna try this, no, it doesn't work. That's right. So I think you teach us better how you do your power. You're clear to the precise to the point where the book has this much information for this. Yeah, oh, oh, right, I got it. But the book, right? Yeah, I think a lot of times I interpret things differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I got that. Oh, yeah. Like, real life. Real life. My situation, I bet you can give a question on the test. People are going to remember what I said exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's why you do, you can't just read and expect to do well. Yeah, this is the application, right? Okay. You read this in the book, here's how it looks in real life. So that's a good observation. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we call this informed trial and error. Okay? We, we pick some re we pick things for a reason, that's the informed part. Um, but it really is a lot of trial errors. Like, oh, we haven't tried this yet. Let's see how it works. Okay. So we talked about the payoff matrix here. We did it. So I'm going to flip fly through these. You have them. Uh, evaluating pressing needs. So these are really, this is the first thing we did is we talked about the quiz. Because you need to know what's really going on here. What's the critical issue? If the person is a danger to self or others, you better be sure that you're going to be dealing with that because that's a pressing need. You can't wait. To deal with somebody's suicidality. Likewise, if they don't have food or clothing, what are we going to do as clinicians? Yeah, make sure to get some food and clothing. <laughs> you know, especially if what did we say right in the beginning, right? Brand new to the person, and maybe they're not into really invested in treatment. They don't see it as a problem. Um, they think I'm just an annoying person that calls them, like, where are you all the time? And all of a sudden, they don't have any food and they show up in my email health center. I'm like, why are you going to this? Sure. They're like, oh, okay. Well, he's not so bad. Maybe I'll go to him next time I need food. And that's what I start out as the food guy. But eventually, he's coming to me. I can start you know, interjecting my little arms of education. Like, hey, did you know that this guy might be coming to Shooting a little bar at them. Six million, it won't come out. <laughs> um, housing instability, what are we going to do there? Help them stabilize their housing. <laughs> because if we have instable housing, it's really hard to work on our drug addiction. I mean, it's really, there isn't really a simpler way to say it. But if you're unsure of like, whether you're going to have a roof over your head tonight or not, that's the worry, not whether or not I'm going to be stopping drinking tonight. So you really have to get a lot of these basic needs met. Are you safe? Are you? Do you have some place safe to, that you can like have a roof over your head? Do you have your basic necessities? You know, and then maybe we can also start to work into some of these other. This isn't this isn't like a um, a list of like least most most dangerous least. These are just things you would want to know about. You know, legal issues, right? It's like, oh, by the way, I got a, I got a warrant out. I don't know. Do you have a question back there, Sean? Um, so these are, you know, could be pressing needs. It's like, okay, we need to, we need to do this. Okay, so you're saying you're going to prioritize first. Um, you're going to evaluate, evaluate which needs are pressing. And yeah, you might need to prioritize. Be like, all right, this is what we need to work on. So is there a drinking is the housing that's making them go that route? Then we're going to and we might need to fix the house before yeah. we adjust the subject. Exactly. Right. Now, if the person comes in and says, I got some crappy housing, but I really want to work on this, we're going to meet them where they're at. We're going to say, okay, right. let's try and do both. But yeah, if, if there's they have no intention, if they're telling you, like, I can't do it right now, let's try and relieve some of these other burdens so that it can become more of a priority. Okay, they helped me with that housing. I don't got to worry about that anymore. And now, what's your excuse? Mm -hmm. What happens if that 
becomes more of a priority than what you originally wanted to work with them on. How do you know when to back that back away from it or work on something else? Well, you certainly won't, don't want to be taken advantage of, right? Um, so if you're feeling like um, manipulated, I would say that would be a good time to sit down with a person and explore that. Um, say your, your question again. Like what happens if it becomes, whichever one of those it is, it becomes too much of a, Predominate, yeah, it predominates the, the, the meeting. Yeah, that balances Yeah, okay. Because that takes a lot of time. Yeah. I've heard a lot about support housing, and that's like. That's so, that. in that case, yes, you I'm trying to answer. Yes, that. absolutely. No, I'm just saying. Because I remember mm -hmm. last week you said that's some of the disadvantages of what we have called rehabilitation is because you have to, whatever time you have to um, take to dedicate. The basic needs is that's what you have to do. You don't even have to be working on decreasing the substance. They need, you know, housing, food, shelter. That's pressing. So it takes time. Okay. It does take time, and it might take extra resources too. So if you're like just running into problems with this housing thing, and you're not a housing expert, you may need. To, you know what? Maybe we should refer you to support housing. And now you're sharing the burden of helping oh. others. Um, or if this is, you know, um, think about somebody with an opiate addiction who's got chronic pain. So what are we going to do here? Maybe we should help the person resolving medical issues because that will help them in turn use less pain. Right? But that's not easier said than done, right? That might take many months or even years of medical follow-up and involving specialists and referrals. But you make the good point, it does take time. And but this is the way to do because you can do it with that issue. The person doesn't necessarily need to use it. You gotta do the real work. Alright. We're gonna jump into persuasion for this now. Alright Sean, I'm gonna attempt to switch PowerPoints. I still need to call What? Oh yeah, Bill. Yeah, I have a quick announcement. Thank you, Shafe. Yeah. So, um, for uh, how many people in here are taking the internship, the practical in the fall? Okay, so we have Marta, Megan, and I'm sorry, Jer Jergen? No, Adriana. Diana and Val. Valerie and Renee. Okay. All right, so um, did you all get the email um, about the uh, orientation on July 14th? Okay, so so uh, again, I just want to check to make sure not everyone has responded. You could? Yeah. Actually, you got back to me on it. Yeah, let's do it over here. Okay. Six to eight. That's during our Thursday schedule. Right, so that means you, that's why we have the three o'clock. So for right. people who can't make that, yeah. we figure that. So, so that's all. So I just want to announce it just to make sure that we'll talk to you. Well, is that orientation just for people who have? Only for people who are practicing. Okay. Just like we'll be able to do the all right, so we have 30 minutes left. We're going to fly through persuasion groups, and I'm going to persuade you how great they are. <laughs> okay, so this is a specific kind of group. Here's an overview. The goal of the persuasion group is to help people develop an understanding of how substance use has affected their lives and become motivated or persuaded to reduce usage or strive for abstinence. This is a real special kind of group. Uh, you need an accepting environment, you need non judgmental clinicians, and you need no censure. 
or uh, confrontation. They really have to feel safe in being able to say, I got messed up last night, and it was great. You know, because a lot of active treatment groups are not used to hearing that, let alone being like, oh, that's cool. Tell me more about how wasted you were. You know, that's a very big part, big departure from some, for some people. Um, so for people in the persuasion stage of PX, that is treatment, um, that is someone who typically has some regular contact with the clinician, but substitute use has not yet decreased, right? So a persuasion group is for people in the persuasion stage, right? Um, and I can honestly say I have some experience running a persuasion group. It went horrible. <laughs> <laughs> because I did not do the things in this book. Um, so let me tell you a little background about this. So I was in I was working in Bridgeway Partial Care. I was the leader of the, they call it the MICA program, the co-occurring unit. And I had some counselors. And we have had identified a group of individuals in our program currently getting services. Younger group, like kind of a, a small subpopulation of the, of the co-occurring population. This group is maybe seven people in the program, younger, you know, young, uh, early 20s, okay, so the, the demographics of the larger group was much younger than them, um, and no interest in stopping. So a lot of them were there, you know, it was a voluntary program. So people should be in a program because they want help, but a lot of people either get mandated there because of probation or maybe parents, again, this was a younger group, so their parents kind of had to say, like, you gotta go here, you can't live with me, kind of thing. So I had this group of like seven, I would call them kids, but you know, they're between 20 and 30 years old, that were sort of really ha having a pro giving us a lot of problems in our life. So we have all these people in active treatment that are not used to hearing what I was saying. It's like, so I went to this group yesterday and this, and then come time for young John to talk. It's like, I didn't go to a 12-step group, and I'm going to get high later. And you know, the active treatment people will get pissed at them. It's like, why are you here then? So we had this, we were like, you know what, we should create a persuasion group. And actually, it's one of the people that I supervised had taken this course, brought it in this book. Showed me, I read it, and I was like, oh, I remember reading this. I tried to run a persuasion. Um, so that's how we did. That's how we identified the need, is we had people in this persuasion stage. It's like they were coming, they were coming fairly regularly, but they were not getting anything out of the program other than fulfilling their probation requirements and being able to tell mom I went to So what happens then? Okay, I've been persuaded. Now <laughs> So you've been in the persuasion group for a while, I started to see, yeah, these, these are negative consequences. I think I do need to be a good gene. Um, people can benefit from remaining in the persuasion group even after moving past it into active treatment. They become respected group members, and this was one of the reasons why my group failed so miserably, is I didn't have any like veterans. You know, you need a couple of people that have been through it. And they're just kind of like the old elder statesmen, so to speak. They can deal with the young people glorifying their drug use still, but and can kind of sit back and be like, just use impart their words of wisdom when it's needed. So I had, you know, I hate to use this term because it's not my use. Um, they were basically in charge of the group, let's say, as opposed to the facilitators because. They were the predominant thought. I didn't have enough prospective group members to balance out this. It's like they were winning the war. Um, but you don't want people in a persuasion group if they are frustrated with these people always exploring. So tell me more about that. Tell me more about how this makes you feel. Some people in active treatment are just like, I've had enough of that. Like, I'm ready to work on it. And that person doesn't belong to this group. Time to graduate. And they would graduate, you know, into a group more fitting of their stage, right? We talked about how the interventions really need to meet where the person's at in their stage. So some of the logistics, so these groups can happen anywhere. Um, mine was in, like I said, a mental health center. Um, they can be in outpatient settings, inpatient settings, veteran programs, 
day treatment, etc. Um, so ours, as I said, was uh, in a mental health center, and we had two leaders. So we really got that going for us. Um, geez. Persuasion groups. Persuasion groups can be integrated with other group treatment as well, or other types of interventions. So as I said, you could have somebody that maybe has moved past persuasion and is into active treatment, but still attending a persuasion group to kind of serve as a mentor to the people that are still in persuasion. Uh, and leaders talk to other clinicians, provide info about the people they're working with. This is saying, like I give an example, thing is like, oh, if she was attending a group and talking about some new hobby to another clinician, and I was in contact with that clinician, I may be able to use that info. Um, to be like, oh, maybe I can use that to help with this persuasion process and say, hey, you know, I heard from one of these other people, one of these other uh, groups that you're interested in this, and you know, oh, this person's interested, um, they able to make those connections. Themes are reinforced consistently in multiple areas of treatment, so people in recovery receive, don't receive contradictory messages. Um, that gets back to integrate, you know, one of the basic principles of integrated treatment. General, all happening under the same agency, everybody get the message. So we had this going for us, and we were meeting weekly. I see that's on the next one. Yeah. We had we had four to six active people. We were meeting weekly. We were meeting on Wednesdays. So that's one problem. We were not meeting near the weekend. So a lot of times you want to put a group persuasion group on a Monday or a Friday. Friday going into the weekend. So what are we thinking about doing this weekend? Huh? Get an idea of what people's party plans are. And then Monday, <laughs> what happened this weekend? So tell me, oh, that would be great to hear those Monday stories, if they showed up. Um, you want to increase meetings in the air at times of year when stress is going to be greater. So that might just be general, like, you know, holidays. Maybe we're going to step up our meeting schedule and have a few more meetings because people are going to be, um, you know, have more opportunity, or maybe there's more negative feelings associated with holidays. Um, it just might be the first one. So it might just be a time of year, or it might be increased meetings for one particular person because they're going through a rougher time and they need that extra support. So you can have a weekly prescription of like, you know, generally speaking, people are going to twice a week for the set 40 to 60 minutes for a group and you might do two hour groups on as I said Mondays and Fridays. Um, so a shorter more focused group would be preferred. Why do you Great. Because sometimes it's hard for them to like pay attention for a long period of time. The cognitive component that comes with that. You know, think about class, right? If you had somebody with a really bad learning disability, have troubles paying attention, you might be better to break up the class into smaller classes, really focus, short and focus, so that attention span does right? And focused, we're actually talking about the topic and not Star Wars. Um, Star Wars is fun, but may not get us help with persuasion. Uh, because again, people might feel like, well, what am I here for? It's, you know, it's going to turn them off, give them a negative attitude about the group. You're really compromising your ability to talk. You're not going to be able to form that therapeutic. Attendance is not required. You don't have to come if you don't want. Why? Yes. Me. It's like the you know, the speech of like, how are you doing? Like, you know. Okay. Well, they that I must do this. You don't want to, yeah, that's a good answer, but in general, you just don't want to exclude them. So, the reason to exclude them, so the re last thing about it, the, the reason, as I talked about, my, the reason for why my persuasion, I'm sorry, we had all these active treatment people, these, these young ones are, are infringing upon our group and making it not what we want to be. Um, so, we said, all right, we got the group. Um, because they were, they were feeling excluded from that, that active treatment. You know, people were not, you know, wanting to hear about all this pro-drug use in a group that's meant to, 
you know, help with abstinence. Mm -hmm. So you want to make them feel inclusive. You want to be non-judgmental. So if they don't show for a few weeks and then come, say, hey, great to see you today. You know, we're not going to, we're going to ignore the fact that we haven't seen you in six weeks. Just an act. Uh, but it's not required that you attend on a week. You're not going to get kicked out if you haven't attended, you know, for a certain amount of weeks, like you would in other groups. There are other groups that are much more like attendance is required, and there's a lot of buy-in. You need to be an active per participant. Uh, it's not required you admit to having a problem. That should be pretty explanatory, right? Because a lot of people don't think they actually have a problem. Um, so we, we throw this show for some info. Come on in. And then we might do other things like um, food. I mean, I'll throw up some food. Yeah. Here, we'll have some pizza. Yeah, coffee. Um, so you want to start a group. It's hard. It really is. Sorry. Hard, right? Um, try and pick a good name if you can. Make it sound really interesting. It's like, Maybe we won't call it like the Swedish group. Boring. What are we going to learn there? Let's call it Stop Life Again, or I don't know, like something that just kind of says more. You get people to get a lot of ownership of a group. They have a say in naming it. It's like, well, they think my name. I'm kind of feeling. I'll show up on um, You can offer food. So you want to try and do things to get people involved. It's like, not necessarily the most important thing that people will be sharing right away. You just want them coming. Hey, have some food. Hey, we're going to be going on this trip. Yeah, you know, we'll talk about, you know, let's talk about how you're doing. Talk about, you know, your plans for this weekend. Sell the fact that you can freely talk about what you're doing. You know, because they can't do that in a lot of things. So it's like, you want to tell us, you know, what you're using? That's fine. A lot of people here don't want to hear it. Um, get to remove barriers. So if they're going to say, "Oh, I can't get to that," oh, I could have a, you know, Freddie the van driver pick you up later. Oh, all right. Well, he's going to pick me up at my house. All right. You know, make it happen. You need to make this group as easily accessible as possible. Um, and then process right before or after for certain things. As I said, like. You know, as we're going to talk about, if you have somebody that you really, you know, you might want to take them ahead, take them aside afterwards to do some of the little process you can't do, you know, arguing. Okay. The therapeutic principles. So, what are we doing here? Why? Why do persuasion groups work? So you're helping people learn more about the role that's playing in their lives. And they do this by just feeling comfortable sharing, knowing that Bill, the, the leader, isn't going to judge me if I tell him how high I was last night and how great it felt and all the great things I did when I was high. He's going to say, hey, tell me more about that. Hey, can anyone else relate to this? You know, oh, what did, uh, you know, Valerie, what did you think of Eric's story? You know, he's going to try and involve peers. Um, so it's going to be educational. Oh, so you're saying you think that that's what the heroin did to you. You know, it's actually interesting because heroin does this. So I don't know why you got that feeling, but it actually wasn't from the heroin. I was something that I learned something today in my persuasion, reaching for the stars. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to remember the name of Mars. It was so cheesy, but it was like what they picked. So, um, interactive, like I said, in the beginning, as facilitators, we're going to take a lead role and say, oh, you know, tell me more. But eventually, we're going to say, you know, what do you think about this? Or, you know, Amanda, can you help Faye with this problem? Or, you know, we're going to try and draw people in to get peers interacting with one another. And eventually, the goal of the practitioner is to see that can happen here. Self-help. Yes. So, so, so I'm thinking it's really one of the ideas that people are like they're they're not at a point where they're ready to be awkward with people. The more they talk about their own stories, other people will be like, "That's stupid. I 
that? So why did you laugh? Is that kind of what? It might be that, or it might be a person saying, oh, I'll happen to me too, you know, and then I have this negative consequence happen. So people get talking, you start to maybe use a little bit of motivational interviewing when we're going to get into the second half of the course to say, oh, that's sort of a little discrepancy between why we with what you told me yesterday, you know, you had this goal, of, you know, so you can start to, start to inject these little motivational interviewing techniques and get people to see, like, oh, maybe this is having more of a negative consequence on my life. I actually thought the book was good here in doing the little role plays that they, did, they showed. Like, so here's an example of what would happen. It was just like uh, a script of like three or four people in a group and what happens. So, you know, you want people to feel supported, even if they're not ready to make changes. You want to make them feel included because so many of those other groups are not going to respect people that are not in the active process, the active treatment process. Because they come back when you're ready to get help, you know. And the confrontation aspect is even going to work with this population. You're not going to be able to scare these people, you know, so much. A lot of them is like, have not learned for themselves. True negative consequences. And it's about helping them discover them. So, um, comfort with the group takes priority over getting people to share. You might have somebody in that group who wants people to say, that's fine. They're listening, though. It's like, as long as they're not being disruptive, right? Um, they're probably listening, and there's a reason that they're coming, right? They're not just coming and not sharing for the hell of it, right? So, the more they come, the more you say, hey, you're great to see you here. You're really happy you come in, you know. Maybe they say one word, and you think, wow, we really appreciate your contribution this week. You're going to get them get them out of their shell a little bit. And the more you can just get them to talk, the more you might be able to interject the wisdom of those older members, placing the, the, you know, the advice or the, you know, oh, yeah, that happened to me too kind of things. Be able to see, like, hey, I'm a legion. A lot of people in this in this persuasion stage haven't yet run into the super. Getting on is still fun. Hasn't become a chore. And so, stick with them long enough, and then eventually they could, eventually will get potentially persuaded. But then I don't want to Group rules, so we talked about that um, with the quiz when we went over it. Um, Want to establish these in the first meeting. A lot of times the group rules are pretty similar to most treatment groups, whether it be active treatment or um, you know, persuasion. We want people to be confidential. Um, easier said than done. Me as the group leader can't enforce this in that I can't. I can't say Faye's not going to leave the group and tell everybody in her town about what happened in the group. We take a vow or, you know, we agree like we will be controversial, but I can't guarantee it. And the group members are like that. But I have to say, my experience working with this population, they are more responsible than typical. You know, the people, I remember sharing things that would get shared in that co occurring group. People in that room had a camaraderie because they all didn't do the same kind of crap and they bonded together and they didn't share that shit. They're like, I don't know. Yeah. It's just a known thing. You just don't do it. And I wish it were that way with some of the other mental health, straight up mental health groups, uh, airing dirty laundry, but there's something about that population where they do seem to take this more seriously. So we talked about if somebody shows up and they're under the influence, what might happen, they're not automatically excluded. Again, what does that goal do? That's going to do the same thing that you know, the active treatment groups taking the person out and talking about how great it was. It's like, oh, you can't be here now. So you're not allowed because if you behave that way. Um, so if they were being disruptive, yeah, we're going to deal with that. We may ask them to leave. But if they can maintain their composure and participate, it's probably a safer place for them to be than out on the streets intoxicated, right? Um, so a lot of times the peers will take it upon themselves to police this kind of thing. 
you know, so me as the management may feel to back because, you know, Nina is pissed that Faye showed up in the group, so she's going to tell, she's going to give Faye a piece of her mind. I'm going to sit back, and as long as it's respectful, I'm going to let it happen. Because that could be more powerful than me, you know, preaching Faye or you know, anything. Um, we do have to be respectful, so I would not let it happen if the person was, you know, name calling or something like that. But um, what about this one? You know, a person is there for a good reason, they need the help. But they're actively psychotic, so when they start to share, it becomes stories about aliens taking over their body, eating, you know, their brains. How would you handle that? Yeah. You have to learn how to do the situation or focus on someone else. You can be like, all right, thanks, Martha, for sharing. Let's see what someone else wants to say. Or almost, you don't want to shut them out. Almost good, right. You don't want to shut them out. So you don't want to just be dismissive. All right, and, you know, turn it. Grab what you can. So even if they gave you one little thing about substance abuse in there, it's like, oh, I'm really glad you're able to, to be able to verbalize how you feel about to use this and ignore the part about the aliens. Right. right. Like, that's not what the group is about. You know, but that's going to come up, and a lot of people that have been in groups like this say on that. Um, but as a group leader, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and highlight what they said that was based in reality, if anything. To try and ignore or minimize the psychosis. Get, get, allow them to feel like a part of it. Um, talked about this the first session, might differ from future sessions in that. We're going to talk about why the group is occurring. We're going to give people an opportunity to introduce themselves, including the group leaders. Uh, we're going to have a thorough discussion about the rules. And then wrap up. Moving forward, you're not going to have introductions every single week. You're not going to go over the rules every single week. You're going to get in there, you're going to say, hey, how's it going today? Everyone's going to share a little bit. And then one of two things is going to happen. Either the, everyone's going to share and the group leader is going to introduce a topic and we're all going to talk about it. Or something that was involved in the sharing is going to become the you know, everyone that's, uh, we're all in a group, and Maria's turn to share, and she's been going through hell, and she's, you know, crying, and it's got a really hard time, and you know what, we're all going to focus on Maria's issue today, and we'll try and help Maria through this, and that's the issue, you know. So sometimes it can be from the check-in discussion, or it can be pre-selected. The, the person that's doing the group really has to be able to go with the flow, and know that even if I have the greatest topic on earth, and I can't wait to share it with you all. If somebody comes in and sort of preempts me with an issue that's more important, I need to be able to roll and be like, all right, well, this is going out the window. I'm not talking about this today. Um, that's just a sign of a good counselor in general, that flexibility, but especially in this kind of The positive interaction, so kind of what people were getting at, lead to increased insight and motivation. Hearing what people are going through, being able to make a connection, oh, that sounds like me. Oh, I'm different in this way. Get the people talking about their experience. The leader then can ask follow-up questions to draw in other people that might be a little unwilling to share, or maybe they feel like might benefit from, from sharing. Uh, and that's how you get people to move from persuasion into effective treatment, like hearing stories, feeling that they're in a safe place, that they're not going to get judged on based on what they say, um, and eventually coming around to say, okay, I think that I've explored enough about why I'm doing this, I'm ready to, to take some action. Any questions on persuasion? Is that my last one? Um, so there are some topics. I actually just wrote see table 9.4 because they have a good list of the different topics that you might do in a persuasion group. Uh, I listed a couple of them as well. So, wasn't that wonderful? Great class tonight. Nice job persuading me of how useful. Well, that was the goal. Can I persuade you into lying as you're eating the crisps? Yeah, please. Yeah. You're going to have to talk about the benefits of why that's good for me. I can't get there. That means you're understanding your non judgmental of us not knowing how to study the book. 
Mm -hmm. and how you can use your message. So it's your better than us in the long run. That's a good try. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's look at what we're doing next week. So next week is the 28th. We have our assessment project to do, and we have some reading to do. When can we post the assessment project? It's on Moodle, it says. Yes. So you will upload it to Moodle, I think starting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, you have this whole next week. What's the chapter? The readings. 10 and 11. 10 and 11 from user, and then we're going to read the beginning of the motivational interview for more to do with Rose. All right. Have a great week. Yep. All right, so Mark, the next one is going to be in there. Okay, great. So I will be there. Yep, I'll see you in the morning. Appreciate the feedback. I'll see you next week. See you next week. Thank you. Yep. Oh, wow, that's cool.